Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim. It's great to see you here today. For two weeks together as a church, we're talking about what it means to be saved. You might have grasped that from the passage. You might have been here last week. But what does it mean when, our things like, when there are verses like our Bible passage that say, God, our Savior, saved us? In our passage, it said, he saved us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Being saved is right at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian isn't just about being a nice person. It isn't just about going to church or being religious. A Christian is someone who has been saved by God, who has been saved by God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, the concept of a Savior, I think, is one we're generally familiar with. Um, I remember reading an article back in January that Chris Whitty was our Savior. You might remember Chris Whitty. He's the government's chief medical officer. He's the one with the eyebrows and the um, charts who was doing the COVID announcements. And this was one headline about him. It said, in these grim times, we all need a savior. And right now, it is Chris Whitty. Um, there might be some people here. You have seen uh, Jeremy Clarkson's farm on Amazon. Well, Jeremy Clarkson, of Top Gear fame, has been described like this. He's described as the savior of farming, the savior of farming, as well as in the media. Um, recently, I had a savior come into my own life. Um, a few weeks ago, a member of this church and a good friend of mine came to fill up my car when I had run out of petrol. Now, you might be asking, Tim, why did you run out of petrol? Well, it's because I drove my car for too long, and then I ran out of petrol. And if there's any evidence that the Lord is working, it's that as I literally, as my car ran out, I pulled into my parking space outside my house. But along came my saviour, Drew Douglas, with a can full of petrol and filled it up. And you might be thinking, is this a kind of metaphor? Is Drew Jesus and the petrols the spirit? I wouldn't, no, don't go that far. It's an image of salvation. That's what we're talking about together. We talked about it last week and we're talking about it this week. We all need saving. Not by Chris Whitty, not by Jeremy Clarkson, certainly not by Drew Douglas of HTC. We need saving by Jesus. And what we considered last week is that we, uh, we saw our great need for salvation. We saw where our salvation comes from, and we saw the basis of it. And you can always catch up on that on our podcast. And we've had it read for us again, but what we saw is that our great need has been met by the kindness, the love, and the mercy of God as salvation has appeared through Jesus Christ. And this week, we're going to take three things. We're going to go through our passage verse by verse, and we're going to see the how, the way, and the why of our salvation. How God saved us, we see that he saved us through, it says. We're going to see why God saved us, as in what was the goal of our salvation. And finally, we're going to see the way. Did I get that the right way? It's only my own sermon. The how, the why, and the way. We're going to see what it means to be saved. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak to us today and you would reveal yourself. God, we pray that we would see all that you have done for us, and it would cause us to rejoice. Amen. Amen. So firstly, we're going to consider, how does God save us? How does God save each and every one of us? And as I put that to you, you might want to say, ah, Tim, I know the answer. We're saved by faith. Ding, 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 five gold stars for you. That's absolutely true. Paul says it in verse 8 of our passage. He says, I want you to stress these things, Titus, so that those who have trusted in God, dot, 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 and so it goes on. We come to God through faith and we trust in him. But what our passage today shows us is how God saves us. Coming to God in faith is like saying, God, rescue me, save me. But how does God complete the rescue mission? How does he save us? Well, the answer is verse 5. Paul writes, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, and so he goes on. This is how God saves us. In his kindness, he saves us by causing us to be born again of the Spirit of God through the work of Jesus. And he saves us by generously washing us clean and justifying us in Christ Jesus. And there's so much to unpack here. You could do a whole sermon series on this sentence if you like. But I just want to show you two things. 
Because being saved and how God does that is all about being made new. A new birth and a new status. That's what we see here. We get a new birth in God and a new status before him. Let's take that first one, a new birth. We see that as we trust in God, verse 5, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. I'll repeat that. He saves us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, poured out generously through Christ. So when we're saved by God, we are no longer the same. We're different. We're new, a new creation. We see that our sin is washed away. It's like God scrubbed us clean, which is what is symbolized in baptism. We see that we're born again, that there's a rebirth, that as God changes us inwardly, we see that we're renewed, which isn't just like renewing your Netflix subscription as in just repeating the same thing, but God totally making us new in nature. And we see that this is all done by none other than the Spirit of God. And you'll notice in verse 6, it says the Holy Spirit is a whom. The Holy Spirit is a person. God himself comes to live in us as he makes us new in him. We become born again as God saves us. That's how he saves us. He causes us to be new, to be renewed, to be cleaned. But also salvation isn't just a rebirth and a renewal. It's also a justification by God's grace. So we see firstly a new birth, God making us new, being born again, but also we see a new status before him. Verse five again, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace. How does God save us? He justifies us. We have a new status before him. This phrase justification is all about, it's like a legal term for a right standing before the Lord. You might have heard the idea that justification, a simple way to understand it is we become just as if I'd never sinned. God sees us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have a new status before him. Despite everything we've done, he washes us clean. He renews us and then he sees us in the righteousness of Jesus, free from all that we've done. Now these two things, a new birth and a new status, they always go together. That's how God saves us. But they aren't the same thing. To be justified by the grace of God means that God declares us righteous. To be born again by the Spirit of God means that God makes us righteous as he lives in us, as he causes us to be born again. Now for some of us, if we're here and we're saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, we might have a very definite sense of when that happened. But some of us won't. You know, I grew up in a Christian home. I'm not particularly sure when I came to the Lord. Yeah, I prayed a prayer when I was young, but, you know, where, where, where's the bit where I became born again? Where can I point to? Now, if you're like someone like my dad, he can be like, Tim, I can tell you the day, the hour, and even the spot on this floor at a conference hall where I was saved and I was born again, he says, at that moment. Some of us will have that and some of us won't. And that's quite all right. But for all of us, Whatever our experience, God has saved us by causing us to be born again and by justifying us. Something new has come. Something new has come. And to help unpack this, C.S. Lewis once gave an illustration. He said this, it's like, a bit like if you're on a train from Paris to Berlin. Some people will be awake at the moment that the train crosses the border of France and Germany. They're awake at the border crossing and they know exactly when the moment happened. But he says some other people won't. They'll be asleep. They don't, won't know when they cross the border, but suddenly they'll wake up and they'll find themselves in a new place. And he said it doesn't matter. What matters is now that you know you're in the new place. You can know that you're a Christian now. Whether we were awake for the border crossing, if you like, whether we were asleep, God has changed us. How does he save us? How does he save us? By causing us to be born again and by justifying us, by making us totally new, a new birth, a new status before him. That's how God saves us. But what is the way of salvation? If that's the how of salvation, what is the way of salvation? In other words, how do we live out what God has done for us? How are we to live? 
Because we see here really clearly a new way to live. We see this in verse 8. Paul sums up everything he's just said by saying, this is a trustworthy saying. And some commentators think that actually what he's just quoted might be a start of a creed or a hymn of some kind. But he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, all these things, the wonderful truth about how God saves us, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to what is good. So that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Last week, we considered how this letter to Titus, it's written from Paul to Titus. Titus was a church planter living in Crete. And Paul was writing to him to remind him of all sorts of things. Here's how to set up churches. Here's how people are to live and so on. And he reminds him here something that we see across all of the Bible. That even though we're not saved by being good, we are saved in order that we might do good. Paul, excuse me, Titus, says Paul, (laughs) stress these things. He says, remind them of the wonderful salvation of God of the new life and the new status we have in him, so that Christians might be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. That's the way we live it out, by devoting ourselves to doing what is good. Now, what does that mean? What does doing what is good mean? Well, there's all sorts of examples across the whole book, but um, a clear one would be at the start of chapter three, just before our reading in verses one and two. Paul says this, he says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceful and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. As we are made new by God, we are called into a new way of living, called into a new way of life. And the things we do, they're like the fruit of of our salvation. They're like the evidence that God has come into us and changed us as we live in a new way for him. But I wonder if we don't always think that that new way of life sounds particularly attractive. Paul says in verse 8 that he hopes that Christians will be devoted to doing what is good. At the end of chapter 2 in verse 11 he said, the grace of God teaches us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. But let's be honest, how many of us see that and all the time can be like, yeah, that sounds so much fun. Being self-controlled, being upright, and being godly. Sometimes we'll hear that and say, yeah, that is what I want to do. That's what I want to put my life towards. And sometimes we'll think, hmm, I'm just not sure about that. That sounds a bit restrictive. Self-control, being upright, ooh. That doesn't sound particularly free. Now, I think it's good for us to ask ourselves, yeah, okay, well, why do we think like that? If God's called us to live in that way and we think, actually, that doesn't sound like freedom, why might we think like that? Now, to understand that, we're going to look at a deep piece of cultural analysis, which is the film Frozen, and specifically one of the songs from Frozen. Now, you might not have realized that Frozen offered such deep, insights into our society, but just listen to these lyrics and think what they reveal about our freedom. Do you want to build a snowman? Come on, let, no, that's, sorry, that's the wrong song. Here's the, here's the right one, it's from the song Let It Go. It's time to see, this is Elsa singing this out. She's sort of left behind her family, she's gone up into the mountains, and she sings this in the story. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. And that doesn't just make sense of the context of her story, but I think that speaks into where we are at and what we might all default towards. Actually, we think it's in a lack of moral absolutes and rights and wrongs that freedom is found. And specifically, I think, it's to do with where thing we feel like moral absolutes and rights and wrongs, rules, are imposed on us by someone else. And now this has come, of course, because we've rejected, I think, a sense of, you know, the Lord, absolute truth. How can there be something beyond us? But it's not that probably that we think that there's right and wrong. It's just where something we contradict with our internal sense of right and wrong, we don't tend to like it because we have elevated the self 
above everything else. And therefore, we tend to think that it's when there's no right and no wrong and no rules for me that I'm free. And following Jesus is not like that. And we don't have to live like that. Part of being saved is bearing fruit for Jesus, living out in that new way of salvation. But we live out our salvation not by throwing off everything, throwing off every right and wrong and throwing off every rule for our life, but by asking for God's grace and for God's spirit to help us devote ourselves to doing what is good, to live in a way that is self-controlled, upright and godly in obedience to him. I wonder what area of your life this speaks into. Does it speak into your relationships? Does it speak into the way that you look after your kids? Does it speak into your, the way you deal with your money? That's one thing God's been really speaking to me about recently is the way I deal with my money and what I think is mine and his and so on. But whatever area of your life this speaks into, this isn't just, Paul isn't just giving a list of rules here. It's not like he's trying to tell people off. He is reminding us of all that God has made us to be and how we're to live that out. He is reminding us of what we were like and now what God has done for us all that have trusted in Jesus Christ. Remember, we've already had it read today, but we considered this in detail last week. He says in verse three, at one time, we too were foolish. We were disobedient. We were deceived, deceived and we were enslaved. But notice he says, we too were like that. The point is, we're no longer like that anymore. Those things don't define us. That's not who we are. The whole thrust of this point is he's saying salvation has come and that's not who we are any longer. We're no longer foolish, disobedient, deceived or enslaved. And instead, if you think about that new birth and that new status before God, he says you've been born again into the family of God. The way he sees you is totally different. He's renewed you totally. You have a new identity, you have a new status and you have a new hope. The old is gone, the new has come. Look what he says in verse seven. He's, Paul writes, so that having been justified by his gra- grace, he says, God did that so that while you might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. You're an heir of God. You're a co-heir with Jesus Christ. You stand to receive the blessings of eternal life because you've been adopted into the family of God. And the call on us is to live that out and to live like those who have been saved. And to live like children of the Most High in every area of our life. I once heard a true story of a Christian family who adopted a young boy. Now, this young boy had um, unfortunately been orphaned, and before that in his life with his family, he'd especially been around crime, a lot of crime, and he himself had been abused so sadly. But they adopted this young boy, became part of their family. But not long after that family had taken in, taken him in, they realized that the young boy was stealing, if you like, from the dinner table. And he was taking food and he was wrapping it up. And they found that he was hiding food in his room. And the reason he was doing that is because he had learned that unless he stole food and kept it to himself, he wouldn't get any and he might not eat. And this happened a number of times before his new parents lovingly confronted him. And they told him, son, you don't have to do that anymore. That's not who you are. You belong to our family and you are our son. You don't have to live like that anymore because you belong to us now. And it is the same with the Lord. He says, you don't have to live in the way that you are living. You belong to me now. You're part of my family. I've given you a new status. I've given you a new identity. I've caused you to be born again. You're an heir. You stand to receive eternal life. You don't have to live in the way that you did. You can instead point your life to being godly, to being self-controlled, to living for me, because that is who you are. That's the way of living out being saved, is living out the identity that God has given us. Because we've got such a glorious hope. For everybody here who is trusting in Jesus Christ, we have such a glorious hope. We see that in verse seven, 
Paul writes, so that having been justified by the glorious, marvelous, wonderful grace of God, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Why does God save us? What's the goal of it? What's it all pointing towards? What's it all about? It's not just we're saved from our past in all that we can live a godly life now. It's that he has given us the hope of eternal life. He has changed our destination and we're going to be with him forever. This is what it means to be saved. See, in our sin, in our foolishness and disobedience, in the fact that we were deceived and enslaved by our sin, that meant that we were under the judgment of God and we stood to receive the wages of sin, which was death and eternal separation from God. That's where we were. But this is the wonder of the gospel, that even though our sin had condemned us to die, in Christ we can receive the gift of eternal life. As we turn to God in faith and say, God, save me. God, rescue me. God does indeed that. He rescues us. He changes us. And he says, you will inherit my kingdom. You will inherit eternal life life. Now for some of us, as we talk about heaven, that feels far off. We might not grasp it. I think that's for two reasons. Firstly, it's because we're pretty set in our Western, rationalistic, materialistic mindset, and we don't have a concept necessarily of that there's more to life than the here and now and the physical. We lose sight of a spiritual reality. And then also, we, we can lose sight of heaven because we're too focused on the here and now, and we're self-reliant. And especially, I think, particularly if you're in the West and you've generally got a good life and you can generally provide for yourself and you're generally pretty comfortable, you think, well, I'm provided for now. Why do I have to hope for what's to come? I've pretty much got it all now. But see, what we have how is nothing compared to what God has promised for all of us. And let me tell you, when life goes wrong, when their life is full of pain, or at the end of life, as you're facing death or someone else you know is facing death, there is nothing like the hope that God offers us. As part of my job, being ordained, being a vicar and so on, I've started taking funerals. And there's nothing like being able to stand up at a funeral and say with total confidence in the work of Jesus Christ, if you trust in him, he will get you through death because he got through death himself. If you trust in Jesus, even though you will die, you will live in him because you can become an heir having the hope of eternal life. And I want to encourage you today to orientate your entire life around this hope that God offers you. To not hope in earthly things, but to hope in the resurrection and to hope that God will one day bring us to be with him. Let that put everything in your life into perspective. Let everything become ordered under that. Especially say, as you think about your money. We've preached for the last couple of weeks about money and how we're encouraging people to give. But when you think about, hey, I'm, this isn't it. This isn't what my life's all about. You can be free because you're thinking, hey, I'm just here for a bit before I go to be home with my heavenly father. I'm not bound by the things on earth like money. Whatever it is, let the hope of eternal life thrill your heart again and put your whole life into perspective. God saved us, not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy he saved us so that we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Let's pray together. God, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you that you've caused us to be born again. And we pray that you would help us live as those who have been adopted into your family and to live out the way of your salvation. And then again and again, Lord, we pray that we would see why you'd saved us. And that you've caused us to become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. And we thank you ultimately for what you did on the cross. Thank you that you gave yourself for us. That a great exchange might take place. Where once we stood to receive death, now we stand to receive eternal life. We praise you and we worship you for that today, Jesus. Amen.